We as NBA fans have been robbed. The biggest and brightest stars of our game have been stolen from us. Entire billion dollar franchises are now forced to reckon with the cold, cruel fact that their franchise player is out for an entire season. For Boston, that meant completely retooling the squad, sending away core pieces Drew Holiday and Kristaps Porzingis. For Indiana, it meant the abrupt end of a magical run, the likes of which we've never seen before in the NBA. Magic they'll probably never muster again. These two would have been devastating enough for the NBA season. But then there's Damian Lillard, who went down in the first round and was waved by the Milwaukee Bucks. Damian Lillard, then DeJounte Murray, Drew Smith, Isaiah Jackson, James Wiseman, and Deron Holmes in the Summer League. Then in the offseason last year, Thanasis tore his Achilles. And just this June, NBA hopeful Jalon Moore also tore his at a draft workout. I speak for all of us when I say this, I know. What the hell is going on? Find out this time on Kip Kame 11. So to begin, let's start by looking at the numbers. Last season, the NBA had zero Achilles tears. In the past five years, there have been a grand total of two. This year, eight. The most in NBA history, almost doubling the previous peak in 2015 that had five. In fact, since 1990 before this season, there have been a total of 45 tears, which averages out to about 1.3 tears a season. It's statistically impossible that this year was just random. In fact, it may just be an inflection point for the NBA, a problem that's laid in the underbelly of the NBA's bright lights for years. It may well be that this season might just be the start. Whoa, what do you mean by that, Kip? You might be saying. You're making it sound like people are about to start ripping their Achilles left and right. And yeah, that does sound ominous, but if we take a look at the data, it may be closer to the truth than you would think. But before we do that, let's turn our attention now to the least known of these casualties, NBA prospect Jalon Moore, a three-star coming out of Birmingham, Alabama. He committed to Georgia Tech and played there for two seasons before transferring to Oklahoma and becoming a big time player for them, averaging some 16 points a game on some efficient splits. Going into the draft, he was projected 63rd by ESPN, so it wasn't incredibly likely that he would be drafted. Even so, he made his way around the league, going from team to team, place to place, workout to workout. The most likely case for him as a four-year player was to go undrafted and then work his way slowly up in the league like he'd done at Georgia Tech. But on his 14th workout with the San Antonio Spurs, he tore his Achilles. He's 22 years old. Now, the reason I emphasize the age here is because in the study that spans all the way back before MJ won his first chip, showed that the youngest player to tear his Achilles was 24 years of age. Now, the age difference might not seem too crazy at first glance, but if we think about it, it's kind of significant. The leading cause of Achilles injuries is overuse, as we'll discuss further. And the fact that it doesn't happen at younger ages, well, because they haven't had a chance to overuse it. Now, you could be saying Moore hasn't played in the NBA, he doesn't count, and that's fair. But if we take a look at the drafted NBA players this season, Season, we find that Deron Holmes, 22, James Wiseman, 23, and Isaiah Jackson, 22, all tore their Achilles younger than the youngest player to do so in the past 35 years. And of course, Halliburton too, who just barely missed the mark at 25. In fact, if we take a look at the mean age of players who tore their Achilles this year, not accounting for Jalan Moore or Thanasis, we find that the average age was on average over two years younger than in the past three decades. Now, these are all still small sample sizes we're talking about here, but you have to admit that there's something especially considering the fact three of the youngest players ever tore their Achilles this year. This trend might even extend to college ball as well. There's not much research done on Achilles tears in the collegiate level, probably because there's not that many, but there was one study published in 2019 that looked at injury data provided by the NCAA from the 2003-04 season to the 2013-14 season. It was found that out of the 255 recorded Achilles injuries, 30% of them were severe, and most of them happened to be in men's basketball. Surprising, right? But in those 10 years, there were five severe Achilles injuries reported. I did my own research and found that since 2015, in the NCAA D1 circuit alone, there have been 19 Achilles tears. Now, of course, before we ring the sirens, let's take this data with a grain of salt. Like I said, the data surrounding collegiate Achilles ruptures is very sparse. And the collection of injury reports comes from an opt-in program that the NCAA devised back in the day. And it doesn't exactly include all teams and all injuries, but it was from teams all across the NCAA, meaning it also includes D2 and D3. Based off of what I found publicly in D1 alone, it's most likely that the rates are indeed higher. So what gives? It seems like these tears are happening to younger players and at a higher clip overall. The average age of the rupture was at 28, and the average amount of seasons played was 8.5. Jason Tatum, probably the biggest blow that the Achilles served the league this season, 
was a year younger than average. But played around the same amount of seasons at eight. Now, this doesn't tell us too much. Jason Tatum famously came into the NBA very young and was booming on LeBron by the time he was 20. He was the chosen one for Boston by the time his rookie year was over. But let's take a closer look at what that means. He's a franchise player from the age of 20, a top option as a Duke Blue Devil, five-star recruit, All-American. That's a lot of time on the court. That's a lot of minutes played. There was an article written after Tatum's injury by Tom Hobbistro, where he pointed out some pretty sobering facts about Tatum's workload throughout his career. In the game where he got hurt, he was approaching 25,000 minutes in the NBA, more than any other player since he's been drafted. He's played more minutes than every single player from the draft class of 2016, despite being drafted a year later. The article also notes that Tatum's played more than Carl Anthony Towns who was in the league when Tatum was in high school. Not, not many people, myself included, really recognized it, but Jason Tatum is an Iron Man. Then we count the Olympics and it's just, the point is, Jason has a lot of miles on his legs, a lot. In the recreational world, Achilles injuries are seen as a plight that affect older athletes, precisely because they have more wear and tear on their legs. But for these younger athletes, the wear and tear is coming younger and younger. In fact, I'd argue that what Jason's been able to pull off is even more incredible given the system that he came out of. The raging capitalistic machine that prides production above all else. The reason the United States of America, despite having the largest talent pool in the world, is consistently beginning to lose to the rest of the world in this new age. The reason the NBA may well be becoming a daddy's money league. That's right, folks. I'm talking about AAU. In 2019, ESPN's Baxter Holmes published what I think is one of the most preeminent sports journalism articles in the past decade. These kids are ticking time bombs, the threat of youth basketball. I'm not exaggerating when I say I think about this article maybe once every three months or so since its publication. It's a piece that covers a topic that I've been wanting to cover for a very long time now, but the time wasn't right. The effects really hadn't started appearing, that is, until now. The NBA has internally known about these issues for years now. If we take a look at the NBA press conference before the 2017 NBA Finals, Adam Silver was expressing his own worries about it. The injuries in the league, what we're seeing is a rash of injuries among young players. What our orthopedics are telling us is they're seeing wear and tear issues in young players that they didn't used to see until players were much older. We know that these young players, now this is before college, are playing in AEU programs, sometimes eight and 10 games in a weekend. We gotta look at the whole system holistically. But fast forward nearly a decade later, and nothing's been done. And that may be what's leading to this sudden explosion. Allow me to introduce you all to a man named Tommy John. Tommy John was a pitcher in the MLB who pitched for 26 seasons, a stretch so long that he became known as the Bionic Man. But halfway through his prestigious career, something felt off. Something was very wrong. He had torn his UCL, his ulnar collateral ligament, and was rendered unable to pitch. The Los Angeles Dodgers medical advisor, Frank Job, devised a revolutionary surgery that seemed like madness at the time. Take out a tendon from another part of a pitcher's arm and sew it right into where the UCL tore. Tommy did the surgery and was out for 18 months afterwards. But when he came back, he played 14 more seasons in the MLB. The surgery was such a success that it became known as the Tommy John surgery. And as of 2023, 35% of current pitchers in the MLB have gotten the surgery. And what do you think is the main culprit behind a UCL tear? That's right. Overuse. Baseball pitchers are throwing faster than ever, putting more torque and power on their elbows, causing the ligament to strain and tear much easier than it was in years past. It's the point now that this surgery is almost a ritual for big league pitchers. But you know who else it's becoming a ritual for? High schoolers. In a study done in 2024, it was found that from 2010 to 2019, over half of UCL injuries came from 15 to 19 year olds. The MLB commissioned a report and found that over 40% of Tommy John surgeries were performed on high school and youth players. In the early 2000s, that number was as low as 20%, half of what it was now. So what's going on? Well, not only are kids throwing a lot more in AAU, they're throwing fast. They're throwing gas. Back in the 2000s, you'd be hard pressed to find five kids who could throw over 95 miles an hour. But in 2023, you could find 35. This is due to power and athletic movements being prioritized above all else. Running this rat race that will inevitably leave you out for a year and a half. Who's to say that the Achilles tear isn't the new Tommy John? Another concerning parallel that we can find is the movement pattern leading to the injury. A UCL tear is typically due to the whip that the pitcher makes on the mound over and over again. Mechanics that, while giving you more explosiveness, leave you susceptible to critical injury. And after analyzing every single Achilles tear from the 2025 season, it's safe to say the NBA has its own culprit, what people are calling the negative step. That false step or that negative step where the athlete steps backwards to protect their center of mass horizontally, 
that mechanism occurred 100% of the time in Achilles tendon ruptures within the National Basketball Association. This is Dr. AJ Pedway, lead researcher of a study that looked into the cause of Achilles injuries in the NBA. So essentially it usually occurs from a static position where the athlete typically has possession of the ball. They step backwards to project their center of mass horizontally and the foot, right, and ankle complex go into what's called dorsiflexion or where the shank kind of goes over the ankle. And typically what we saw in over 70% of the cases, the foot was actually externally rotated or turned out. And that tensile load on the Achilles, right, along with the rotary mechanism of the foot, kind of caused the Achilles tendon to rupture. If we take a look at every tear, going back to Kobe, we see that it starts with that false or negative step. It didn't exist in the NBA all too long ago because, to be honest, it wasn't necessary back then. But with every single player being maxed out in athleticism and quick movements being more essential than ever before, the extra percentage points you get of a boost on the court are critical. It's been implemented now at the youth levels, and young kids are now putting strain on their Achilles that once weren't there. But beyond these specific movement patterns, which in moderation aren't harmful at all, definitely not in the career altering sense, there's a deeper problem. I touched this briefly in my daddy's money video, but kids aren't playing multiple sports anymore. This is known as early or single sport specialization, and it's a problem. Everything has become more specialized, and if you play another sport or two other sports, you kind of get behind in your main sport. I was someone who lettered in four sports in high school, football, baseball, basketball, track. The cumulative work from all those different sports helped me. We never had year-round anything. Everything was always seasonal. Basketball for me was, you know, you got some school basketball, and then when I was in high school, you had AAU for two or three months. These kids are playing 100 plus games in the summer. Yeah, I just feel like if you've gone through four years of AAU, you've probably put anywhere from two, three, four, four years of grind on your body by the time you get to the league. Studies show that single sport specialization leads to more injuries due to the simple fact that you end up overusing muscles from that singular sport. I met someone at a run club the other day who's been running since they were 19. They're 55 now. He played basketball in Maryland and somehow from there ended up being a D1 10K runner. I don't know how. It's kind of crazy. But he told me in the 30 plus years of running and hooping, he never had a singular injury not on the court or on the track. The guy also trained like a triathlete, incorporating swimming and cycling as important parts of his training. It was the epitome of generalization, and it landed him a healthy athletic life into his 50s. As a young kid looking to make the league, you don't get that chance anymore. How long do you have to work at something before you become really good? It's an extraordinarily consistent answer in an incredible number of fields, and that is you need to have practice to have apprenticed for 10,000 hours before you get good. Malcolm Gladwell, famed self-help psychologist and author, wrote a book called Outliers in 2008. It became a global sensation and somehow made its way into the curriculum of AP Langenkamp. I don't know how. In the book, Gladwell popularized the concept of 10,000 hours, where in order to become a world-class expert at a certain skill, you must spend 10,000 hours to master said skill at the highest level. In other words, practice, practice, practice makes perfect. Looking at teenage chess grandmasters and musical prodigies, that's what did it for them. But how are you gonna get those hours in and get ahead of the ultimate skill competition that is a professional sports league? Well, you practice, practice, practice at eight years old, then you go to your personal trainer. Then you play game after game all year long, chasing as many reps as you're physically able to at the time. That maintains itself all the way up to high school where you don't have time for track or football. You're trying to make a league. You hoop, winter, fall, spring, summer. On weekends, you're playing in tournaments. That's six games, man. We take a look at Jason Tatum and forget the two extra seasons worth that he had at 27. On his legs coming into the league, I wouldn't be surprised if he already had three seasons of wear and tear coming in. This crisis is not only killing the fun that kids want to have playing sports, the original intent, but also a chance to recover their muscles and work new ones in different movement patterns. Instead, kids crash and burn, able to do a three 60 dunk, but unable to stand on one leg. Kids are playing sports now more than ever, but the ones who are trying to take it somewhere are only playing one. A study in 2021 polled a sample of about 800 high school basketball players and found that 73% of them played solely basketball. And for kids under the age of 14, that percentage was 58%, which is kind of crazy, right? 60%. Think back to your high school days. If you hooped, could you imagine not doing track or football in the off season? Just AAU as a freshman, eighth grader, seventh grader? I'm imagining if you did, it was because of the belief it would make you better faster, but that's the worst part. 
it doesn't. A study found that early sports specialization before puberty doesn't have a significant impact on one's chances of being an elite player. On the contrary, it may hurt a child's chances of becoming elite due to psychological stress, injury, and an inclination to quit. Hey, listen, LeBron played football up to junior year. Jordan played baseball in high school. Kobe played soccer 24 seven up to the time he was 14. The greats of the game didn't have to give up their sports before puberty, but our stars of today. Jason Tatum played football maybe when he was eight or 10 years old. Tyrese doesn't have any record of playing any other sport. Neither does Shea or Brunson. Our only guy? But I was fourth, fifth hitter. You know what that mean. Clean up, yeah. Scrape clean up on aisle three, come, come get it. This is clearly a trend that's happening in the NBA and it's not necessarily for the better. A study conducted in January took a look at NBA players who played multiple sports in high school, a number that was less than 30% and compared their availability and injury history to players who only hooped in high school. It was found that in the first three seasons of the league, multi-sport athletes played in significantly more games, traveled greater total distances and had a significantly lower percentage of games missed due to injury compared to single sport athletes. Multi-sport athletes also had a significantly higher player efficiency rating and award achievement likelihood. The evidence shows, even if it felt like it took year round hoops in order to get to the NBA, some of these guys are getting lapped by those who didn't make basketball a sole priority. Speaking of souls, there's another theory running around that says a contribution to the Achilles crisis of 2025 is due to low top shoes being in style and the lack of protection of the Achilles resulting in injury. There may be some merit to that, hold on to that thought, but something else that I don't think has been discussed is the traction of today's NBA shoe. There's a brilliant video by Foot Dr. Zach, a little crazy, speaking about how advanced traction in today's shoes also contributes to the problem. It all comes down to grip. There are some stability elements in the shoe, but it's the grip of the shoe that can actually really increase the load on the calf muscles. And low top shoes don't exactly help either. A study, I know so many studies, looked at the strain that the Achilles tendon goes through in different shoes. And it found that wearing high top shoes saves the Achilles 10% stress per load action. While low tops of course are more freeing, it may be to player's detriment. I mean, when's the last time you've seen someone snapping at high tops? So yeah, this trend is pretty disturbing. While things are getting better on a recovery front, it takes less than a year to return now when there's successful case studies with Katie and Clay. But on the aggregate, an Achilles tear still really sucks. If you're a pitcher that's out for a year and a half due to a UCL tear, yeah, that sucks too. But oftentimes you come back as good, if not a better pitcher due to form work. For the NBA, there's no skill that being in a cast for weeks and literally relearning how to walk can really teach you. Going back to the study that's pretty much the definitive text for this stuff, the outcomes are very bleak. They looked at 37 players from 1992 to 2019 and found that the cumulative economic loss from Achilles tendon ruptures in the NBA was $117 million. Overall return to play rate was 78% and 31% of players who returned to play were out of the NBA within three years. Over half of the players that suffered an Achilles tear this season were, to be frank, fringe NBA players. Drew Smith was, I kid you not, cut five times from the Miami Heat squad before his Achilles tear. Given the time to recovery and inevitable loss of explosiveness, it's a curse for NBA players. The last non-marquee player to rupture his Achilles was Brandon Clark for the Grizzlies. And he got lucky thanks to signing his four-year extension just a few months prior. The guy before him, however, wasn't so lucky. Chris Clemens, a high flyer out of North Carolina, despite being 5'9", made his way to the NBA. He averaged 30 points a game at Campbell University and became the third highest scorer in NCAA history. He went undrafted, but tried out in summer league for the Houston Rockets and did well enough to land an Exhibit 10 contract, which turned into a two-way. In the 2020 season, he made his way on the court a few times and even scored 19 points in a game. Things were looking up. Then he tore his Achilles. Not even a month later, the Rockets waved him. He finished his recovery and made it back to the G League, even scoring 27 points in one quarter on perfect shooting, crazy stuff, but ultimately went to Xinjiang to play for the Chinese Basketball Association. And he just finished up last season overseas in France. What's to say that if Chris didn't tear his Achilles, that he would have made a roster spot in the NBA? If we look at Drew Smith and Jalon Moore and Isaiah Jackson, and Deron Holmes, will their careers, earnings, and life suffer because of this injury they sustained? Not when their Achilles finally popped, but when it was finally decided. Ball is life. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy, man, tap in.